Hi, everybody. This is Kara Thrasher Livingston, and I'm here with Delight Mills and Kat Sawa Lipinskis, and we are your care coordinator training slash support team. And Cassandra Lynch is here too. Really nice to see everybody. Um, we are trying to up our accessibility game. So hopefully you can see our captioner to the right. No? Not yet. Can you share your okay. screen? Let's start to share my screen. Now, now you can read what I've already said, sort of. <laughs> can you see it okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So like I said, we're trying to increase our accessibility um, options here. And this, because of that, we have a, uh, a web captioner and hopefully everybody enjoys that and it works out uh, for us as we progress in our meeting here. This is our care coordination monthly info share. And we're super glad that you're here with us. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and write to us in the, the questions panel, just go for it. Um, that is how, of course, you know, that's how we'll be interacting uh, today. And we do have our agenda posted and I'm gonna move a couple things around so I can see it. So today we are gonna talk about a few things. We're gonna um, be reviewing the care coordinator contact info and um, that's an email that came from CAT to all care coordinators, care coordination support at alaska.gov. Uh, there is some great information in there that I wanted to review. And we'll, we'll be talking about our LMS and our recent training that we're taking care of for CFC and Delight is heading that project. Um, and Cassandra has been working hard on our CIR training her having it in our LMS, and that means our learning management system. A couple of reminders, and um, then we'll, uh, we'll open it up for questions, Q&A, okay? So let's take a look at, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. This is just a, uh, a capture of the email that was sent from care coordination support at alaska.gov. So we do have this new address and Kat is our care coordinator liaison and she answers the emails and we sort of share that too. Uh, so hopefully you are accustomed to emailing care coordination support at alaska.gov with your questions about care coordinator issues. Um, of course, you can continue to send questions regarding training to uh, SDS training at alaska.gov. And if you don't know which to send it to, you can always send it to both. A lot of the Harmony stuff, Kat's real good with, and she's been able to help you with that. Um, so hopefully you're having some success with those resources, with care coordination support email and SDS training email. We have transitioned our office hours to uh, care coordination support office hours and formerly the training office hours. It's every Tuesday from four to five and every Thursday from eight to nine a.m. That would be four to five p.m. of course, and every Thursday, eight to nine a.m. We'll continue to have training uh, office hours as well, specifically supporting our trainings that we do with a time to interact with those who are participating in our trainings and we'll have more information come out about that as we do our deep revisions uh, with our learning management system and our trainings in general, our different learning units. So we'll have live interaction, so to speak, or virtual interaction available on Zooms. Uh, so look for that and feel free, of course, to join CAT and training staff with uh, training with care coordination support office hours. And the link to Zoom is there. I know you won't be able to click it because it's you're seeing it through a webinar, but um, just go back to your email maybe, and we can send it to you in a link again after the session. Speaking of that, everybody will get an email, who, everybody who attended the session today now will get an email that uh, assures your 
see your care coordinator CEH continuing education hour. So you get credit for one hour of care coordinator CEH. Okay, uh, we get a lot of questions about draft plans or notes done in error and you need something deleted. So Kat's provided some great resources for you here, depending on the kind of waiver that you're working on, IDD um, or NFLOC waiver, level of care waiver. And when in doubt, and you just can't remember the top two, you can always email care coordination support at alaska.gov and we'll take care of that uh, draft or error entry. We'll take care of that deletion. Um, the Harmony Guide was sent to you in Kat's most, probably not the most recent, but, but the recent one that's, that had Info Blast in the title. Okay, so you should have a copy of the newest um, Harmony Support Guide. Okay, and I'm gonna scroll down a little bit more. A resource directory was provided. We did get a lot of questions about psychological testing resources for individuals who are seeking eligibility uh, for the IDD waiver or maybe other folks who just need a, a psychological test. Um, and Kat, provided that. So we'll go ahead and call that up as well. And just give me a second to pause my screen while I search for that. And I'll also check the questions just to see what is there and if anyone has entered a question so far. All right, awesome. Of course, I have to rearrange it to fit with my captioner, but that's okay. So I did drop some in the chat. This is different than the question box. I did drop in the contact Zoom link and Kat's um, email. And I also dropped the T24 care coordination guide into the handouts as well. And I can try to grab the resource directory that you're pulling up and drop it in there too. So if that's all too much, uh, you can always pull it up from that email as well. You don't have to be trying to download or copy this stuff in session as there's just resources available to you. It, should you like to try to do that? Okay, so you should be seeing our resource list that was shared. And I'm gonna move things around a little bit so I can see what I'm doing here on my one screen. And this is just your uh, resources for the psychological testing. And you can see that there are some in Anchorage, Eagle River and Chugiak, and I appreciated the notation from Kat that said that these are folks that we see reports and evaluations coming from um, commonly, but it is not necessarily everybody that there is. So there may be more out there. Or you may be working with one that is not on the list. That's okay. This is just a, a common list of resources for um, psych testing that we have. All right, so there's Wasilla and Palmer as well, and Fairbanks. And we're just looking quickly at the list. Kotzebue, Nome, Bethel, and Kenai and Soldatna, and Kodiak, and Juno, Sitka, and Craig. Catch a can and a statewide resource there. So thanks again, Kat, for putting that together. It's extremely helpful. Um, we, we all really appreciate that. And I certainly, certainly learned a lot just by getting that list myself. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to our uh, agenda and go up a little bit so that we yeah. can, yeah, go yeah. ahead. 
Mm -hmm. we're, are we going to drop that list in the handouts or we'll email it? Um, it was already emailed, but if folks okay. want it, we can put it in. Mm -hmm. It's in. Yeah. I've yep. dropped it. Okay, sweet. Thank you. All right. So for CFC, uh, we've been working hard on putting together training involving work with our internal staff around CFC and the inner workings of Harmony. And the purpose of this is to create updated training. And it's always extremely helpful when we work with our internal staff and put together training, run it by our staff and maybe a test audience, if you will, so that we can be aware of the different handoffs and procedures, and then offer training for care coordinators. Delight, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I'm gonna try to see if I can get my captioner to work to Kara. So just give me one second to see if I can do that smoothly. Um, okay. Do you wanna tell me when you're ready? And I'll just do a couple other quick reminders. I think I have it. Um, oh, you do? Okay, me, cool. Yeah, let me see if I got it. Um, I, it looks way bigger on my screen than it did on yours, so just let you all know. We're just kind of giving this stuff a try. Um, so let me see. Um, okay. Well, quickly, just a super easy reminder. Um, oh, there you go. Cool, you got it. Uh, is it there? All right. Well, it is. So talking about CFC, some of the biggest questions that we have been receiving is how to handle um, the PCS paperwork. So I'm even seeing in here in some of the chats and uh, I see some of your emails that I haven't had a chance to respond back to yet. I'm just coming back from some leave. Um, the big piece to really focus on for PCS services is that there's a lot of paperwork forms that are specific to PCS functions. The trainings that we're working on right now um, really have kind of been like a sweater pull in the sense that we're noticing little changes here and there that have to be done to these forms uh, and to and make some efficiencies uh throughout our entire division so it is taking a little bit longer to accomplish just because of how um you know we're discovering and then uh, fixing it and then creating training materials for it and i've been working with a lot of different um, teams like we're all cooperating together because we all want this to go a lot smoother for everyone from your clients, to you, to PCS partners, and internally. So um, we're working on making that happen. And that's really where we're at with the process right now. You'll be hearing when we're ready to launch that training externally. Um, so it it is in the works and we're hoping that by the end of it, it'll kind of be like a relaunch, a rebranding of CFC so that it's a little bit easier to follow. Okay, so stick with us and keep asking your questions. Um, keep reaching out for when you're dealing with CFC and you're not sure where to go with it. Contact Kat at Care Coordination Support or, or myself and we'll work with you on figuring it out together so that it can be done as smoothly as possible, as quickly as possible until we get things sorted. So that's it. That's all I had, Kara. Awesome. Thank you, Delight. All right, just moving something around here. Okay. And we're, we are working on developing trainings in and for our learning management system. We, uh, Cassandra has been working on having the critical incident report training available on it. In general, we're doing a deep revision and modernization of our learning units to include accessibility features and different, um, different arrangement of topics. 
Cassandra, did you want to add anything about the CIR training within our LMS? No, because we don't have it finished. And once it's finished, I'll be able to talk to it a little bit more. Okay, cool. So uh, another reminder to like and subscribe to get notification of new videos that we put on our YouTube channel, like this one today, we'll be putting this up. Give us a little bit of time. It takes about an hour or so to make sure it's all uploaded. But there will be recordings of all of our webinars, like the one that was regarding ARPA, A-R-P-A, um, the direct support professional incentive fund available to agencies. Um, all being posted on our YouTube channel. And if you like and subscribe, meaning subscribe, you, you'll get a notification. Um, next month, our meeting will be July 5th, and we'll have Deputy Director Anthony Newman and our Director John Lee, and hopefully our Commissioner Adam Crum or somebody he delegates. If you remember, we had a, an agreement to have a quarterly meeting with um, with our leadership officials like this for care coordinators. And that is on their calendar. Um, not sure if it will be um, Commissioner Crum or someone that he delegates, but one of the two with our director and deputy director. And of course, all who attended this webinar today will get an email verifying one hour of care coordinator continuing education hours after the webinar. Give us some time to get your email together because sometimes we have other resources to share and we just kind of collate it and then put it out. All right, so it won't be immediately, but it'll be soon after the webinar. Okay, and that was my entire agenda. Anybody want to add from this team? Anything else to add, Kat? I think I'll just add one thing about the place of service billing codes. That's kind of come up a couple of times. Um, and we are working on it with leadership to kind of provide clearer guidance. I know I sent a couple of emails to a couple of you guys with some information on what the codes mean and to kind of not look at it as telehealth because care coordination is not a telehealth service, but it really more has to do with where the the recipient is and how you are contacting them. So I'm working with Lynn and Caroline um, and Kamajan, Kamajan to provide some guidance to you guys um, regarding what that's going to look like. I know there's some tef the questions about Tefra, uh, how long we're going to be using the code. So I'll have more information uh, in the next couple of days. I'll provide that as I get that. But that's the only um, thing I would add. Okay, great. Thank you. Questions coming in about that. Those codes are not offered for place of service and payer path or in explanation. Are we going to be helped, held accountable for those codes in an audit? The codes that are on the email are not even in the drop down box, boxes for care coordination in payer path. These are all issues that we're aware of. And so we've brought them forth to our leadership for clarification. Okay, so we're working on that. Um, again, this is more um, conduit, uh, questions for conduit. So um, give us some time to put that, to put that resource together for you. Okay, question says there's an article in Anchorage Daily News just posted that the COVID-19 public health emergency is set to end on July 1. Per DHSS, Adam Crum, what is the transition plan for all the flexibilities? Um, best, best quick answer I could give to that, and I haven't seen that, so I can't, you know, we're, I'm not giving an official end of the public health emergency thing info here, but we have always shared since the duration of the public health emergency that the flexibilities, we have permission from CMS to extend flexibilities for six months past the end of the public health emergency. And that's the federal declaration of the end of the public health emergency. Okay, so that might be different than what you're seeing. I do not know, um, but 
We'll certainly reach out and ask for clarification on that. But my best answer is six months after the end of the federal declaration of the public health emergency would be when our flexibilities would end. Transition plan would come out as step by step as these things happen, just like we transitioned into them, we'll have transition out of them. Um, the Zoom link is has now transitioned to um, care coordination support hours. We will not have the Tuesday and Thursday Zooms. So you'll need to either check your email from CAT or I should say care coordination support at alaska.gov or just we'll include those links in this email after our session today so you'll have them okay lots of questions about that billing any team member want to jump in yeah i would just remind anyone oh, remind you all that if you're using the harmony system to add your plan services and the billing codes are going to be fine. Just keep using that for now. Um, that would be my recommendation is continue to use those protocols. If you're using a um, appendix K to just like overview, like oh, you're, you're doing that process, it's going to be stickier, not, not going to sugarcoat it. Um, we're starting to get to a point where it's going to be a lot easier to have your work in harmony just on how our billing and how we're updating the codes. Um, so if you're in a tough spot where you're like, I'm not sure what I should be doing, consider um, coming to an office hours and we can check and help you figure out how to fix it in the specific case you're working on. Okay. But if you're using harmony to create your support plan, you're and you're using the plan services to get the correct service it should be fine okay thank you some questions from the question list here there's one that says i'm seeing a lot of providers who are pushing back on signing renewal support plans without new rate sheets coming out but care coordinators are required to have these in a certain time frame meaning renewal plans. When we upload these into Harmony with a note stating a provider will not sign, we have an incomplete assigned. What would you all suggest to do in this situation currently? Okay, so if I get it right, when you're talking about rate sheets, you're talking about our cost overview. Have, Kat, have you heard that question before or recently about providers not signing or new cost overview sheets? No, that has not come up. It, okay. It came, there was one question about cost sheets, but it wasn't, it was about okay. the regions and not, no, I haven't. Okay, heard that. gotcha. So what I can offer is um, the, the cost, the rates get changed periodically. And it's usually on or about July 1st that that happens, right? It's actually always July 1st. So what happens is we, we get all that information through Office of Rate Review. Then we put them out onto our cost sheet overview sheets, right? And in my experience over the years, I've found that it's a little confusing because providers sometimes assume that the rate that's on the cost sheet because a rate has say a rate has changed right we don't have a new sheet posted right there that day and you know you've got one you've got a plan due and you're trying to get them to sign it and they know that it's not today's rate so the cost overview sheet is not connected in a hardwired way to the payment that the the agency will receive okay it is an estimate of the entire amount of services that are requested on a plan and the actual billing that's related to the plan is many 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 steps deeper than that because the the billable unit means it's an it's a service in an approved plan from a current vendor for a person who's who has medicaid and has gone through all the eligibility for that and eligibility for the the services themselves staff have done the service and have 
done it correctly, the staff have their correct training, and then it's documented correctly, right? So that's a short list of what, what is done to create the billable unit. Um, a lot of times, it, and this is just my observation, just working with providers and care coordinators over the years, people tend to look at the cost overview sheet and sort of use it as like a budgeting thing, like in their mind, they think of it as a budgeting item. It is not that, should not be thought of as that. It is a support plan for a person and it's a plan, okay? And that means that it can change and anything can change. I mean, tomorrow the person could get something different. The person could move away. The person could not want the service. The person could pass away. So it is a plan. And my best suggestion here is, you know, we have to adhere to deadlines for renewal plans. Um, if we're having problems with our providers, then, you know, you could ask a provider to contact training, right? They could contact SDS training at alaska.gov for an explanation. As a care coordinator, you could give a simple explanation like that. I'm not saying that you have to educate all providers as to these things because, you know, it, it's really you're just to the person, right? You're there for the person. But if it's going to hold it up, then that's not in the best interest of the provider and it's not in the best interest of the person and it's not in the best interest of the care coordinator. Um, worst comes to worst, of course, there's quality assurance and you can make a quality assurance report. I'm not trying to say that's the, you know, the first thing that you should do always, but you're welcome to do that. It's there for you. Um, and that's what I can offer about that. I mean, we'll have, we have educated as to that angle an understanding um, for many years. Yet I get it. When you're out there working, people don't, you know, they see costing on a sheet like that. It comes from the state via the care coordinator and it's kind of all put together like that. Um, but it's not, you know, we've had cost sheets that say something different and today's rate is different. They've they've changed like that over the years. And the cost sheets signed off on, but the provider bills and gets paid the current rate of the date. The date that the service was delivered and that's just how it's done uh conduit hey, could probably help too yes so i'm seeing that some people are having internet latency issues and so they're losing audio on and off so i'm going to turn my camera off unless i need to talk um just to help with that okay right questions about rates I would have people go to the Office of Rate Review, okay? Connect with the Office of Rate Review about that. They are the ones that handle rates, okay? There's a few comments about rates. Returning in July plans with cost sheet overviews. When, we're going, when are we going to get updated cost sheet over, overview forms to reflect rate changes? Um, I would have to check on that exactly because I'm not sure that rate changes, I, I couldn't state for sure that with confidence that I know rate changes are happening on July 1, okay? So we can ask that question. Um, we try to post them as soon as we can, you know, but like I said, you may be in a situation where for a little bit, you have a rate sheet that doesn't match that day's costs or the, the fu near future costs. And people should still sign them. It's not directed, it's not connected directly with the payment piece of it. It's a support plan. And they're gonna get paid the rate that's approved on that day, the day they do the service. Um, okay, I'm looking for questions. Okay, the Uni 14, Appendix K Uni 14 does not show increased rates, okay. We're going to take a look at that and we'll bring that we'll bring that to the attention of folks that do the charts. Okay? We'll do our best to to get the charts that you use updated. Just kind of right? know that I mean and, and you guys all of your many of you have already submitted your July plans already. So we're already kind of like I'm it's unfortunate that you're giving some getting some hold up on it um because you have to turn them in and we aren't sure mm -hmm. what exactly those rates are going to shake out to but um we get stuck in that mm -hmm. we do get stuck in this almost every year 
because of the nature of support planning, which occurs in, in before the actual support plan. You know, it's turned in ahead of the expiration. And these ones are, are it's just the nature of it. Okay, so I, I would like providers to understand it like that and to go ahead and sign and that it is in their best interest to sign as the provider of the service and to understand that when rates change, they change. And that's what will be provided when the service is delivered, they're gonna get paid on that day, the day the day they deliver is what I'm trying to say, not literally paid on that day, but the day they, they deliver it, it'll be paid at the rate that's approved. Okay. All right, just some comments, a helpful comments. Um, larger agencies who can no longer afford respite at today's rate. These are, are all comments that should be directed towards our Office of Rate Review. Um, the, my best training answer here would be, you know, Office of Rate Review sets the rates according to the research that's done through the um, reporting that, that providers are required to do, including care coordinators. And so when you report, when you do your reporting to Office of Rate Review, then that is how they set the, the upcoming rates. Okay, your costing, um, costs of doing business for lack of a better way of putting it, reporting that you do to Office of Rate Review. It really isn't, isn't I mean, we're tied together, but it's, it's not, it's outside of SDS's work. So I would direct them to Office of Rate Review. A uh, question says, since the rates are typically an issue, would it be possible for rate review to make determinations earlier so we could derail the issue moving forward? Um, great question. Uh, I wish I had a better answer to it. Uh, we could always ask them that. Um, since I've worked with the division, we haven't had predetermination of rates like that. Okay, but I think it's a great idea. Yeah, it's always right on the date. Um, and rates are always an issue, always, always, because it affects everybody's bottom line. You know, there, there hasn't been an easy way around that one. It's, we've been going at it with the understanding that, you know, a support plan is a plan. A plan is not a guarantee of payment and shouldn't be used, the, the cost sheet shouldn't be used as a budgeting tool and it shouldn't be viewed as you know, the care coordinator is granting you this payment by you signing this. It is not that. It is a simple summary of the estimated costs of the person's services, or I guess unit total of the person's services. And, and as a provider, it's more important to be thinking about, and it's also important to be thinking about the reimbursement, of course, because we have a lot of advocacy around that. We have a lot of interaction around that. It's in our regulation process that we have interaction around rates. There's cost reporting that providers do to Office of Rate Review. I'm not trying to diminish that at all, um, but when it comes to the microcosm of the support plan and a care coordinator handing it to you, me as a provider, I would be thinking about the work to that person and serving that person and it should be the focus should be on the work towards the person and signing that plan for the person's care or support, their plan for support. Okay, lots of comments about the reimbursement rate for respite. Again, we can direct that towards our Office of Rate Review. Um, let me see, there's probably some other great ideas here. Yeah, we, we do have our overview sheet in Harmony that, that uh, you know, th there's a process to changing that if it was going to be different. That's, that's for sure. Uh, comments include, all right, agencies are struggling with providing respite. Respite is reimbursed at a higher rate than PCA, but I continue to hear agencies are paying a lower rate, so staff refuse the hours. That's confusing to me. I get that. Um, 
Providers consider the cost sheet and plan as a contract. Unfortunately, they do use it as a budget. Yeah, it, it really isn't to be thought that way. It runs into problems when you assume that you're billing out whatever it is that you think you're billing out. But Medicaid is a fee for service. It is not like a, a grant. A grant is like a lump sum like here, you know, you get that and do stuff with it. Medicaid is a fee for service model. Service has to be done, then you bill it. And there's a whole lot going into billing the service, as I said. Suggestion, it would be nice to have a letter to provide to service agencies to remind them of the cost sheet meaning when they pu give pushback. That's a great idea. Let me inquire about that. I'm just gonna make a note to myself. Okay. All right. I'm not sure that we, our team here, has had the level of inquiries about that um, to raise a, a question like that. But I mean, it, it's, I'm not saying that you're not confronting it. I think that you are. So, you know, we can inquire about something like that, a letter, and just kind of bring it up. And it is, it is a seasonal issue. Um, and the comment says the plan isn't even a guarantee the service will be available from any provider when approved, let alone the current rate. There's that and there's many, many, many other things. Mm -hmm. uh, question says, and I appreciate that comment too, by the way. Um, is there somewhere that we can gain access to the equation for how they establish the care coordination rate? These are all questions that would be directed towards Office of Rate Review. Okay, other questions, comments? Maybe one of these webinars, we could have a rep from Office of Rate Review since all your concerns seem to be answered only by them, answerable only by them. I don't know about all of them. We've provided some answers here, but sure, we can reach out to Office of Rate Review and say that we have many questions. All right, comment says, I have families requesting amendments all the time to change service agencies that offer staff higher pay. They jump around every few months and there's a big staff shortage. This is true. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or thoughts? Question says, this is a different topic, but is SDS doing anything to try to recruit additional EMOD providers? Had a hard time getting any providers to complete a bid for work. Is anybody on the team aware of uh, EMOD outreach right now? I am not. I am not aware of recruitment for EMODs at this time. And EMODs are have traditionally been like kind of sparse. EMOD, so EMOD providers. But no, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't heard anything either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, Kara, I flagged one of the questions up above that you might have missed. Okay. Uh, question says, who would we direct guardians questions on medication management while the guardians take daily respite? Okay, so the respite provider should be providing medication for the person while they're 
having the the main caregiver is having respite. So it depends on what has to happen. I mean, if it's medication administration, then that is going to have to be overseen by um, by nurse a nurse with usually within the agency. If it's assistance with self administration of medication, the respite provider can do that. So best question as to who to direct them to would be the agency that is providing the respite. They just need to make sure that the person takes their meds while they get respite, has assistance to take their medication while they have respite. Okay, comment says transportation and escort are difficult to find providers to do that. So transportation, waiver transportation, um, the, the escort person could be somebody, could be anybody. It's not an employed, it's not an employee of the, the transportation place. It's somebody, the person that's there to help them, okay? So transportation provider, um, they can bill for that because it's somebody sitting in the seat on the bus, so to speak. But yes, transportation providers, I've seen that a few have closed. So we're aware that they're not as plentiful as they have been. Mm -hmm. I would suggest it's, it's the same EMOD issue. Who from SDS can, can address this issue? You know what I can do? is I can develop a summary of these questions and we can direct them, we can give um, Director Lee and our uh, Deputy Director Anthony Newman a list of questions from this session, things that remain unanswered uh, from today for their next, for the next session, which they will be at. Okay, so there was a question about DPA paperwork and that being moved forward timely. Lots of questions about the rates, those types of things. Probably best if we just give it to them and they have a heads up of what we're wanting to know. That might be good. Okay, question about the new Uni 04. It only has one space to sign. If we have two signers for a POA, as required by the document, the POA document, are they both supposed to sign on one line? I think my best answer to that would be yes. Kat, do you agree that we could have two people sign on one line if the POA document requires two? Yeah, we should be able to, or next to it or somewhere below it. I think there'll be I think I'll go for that. Um, but I'll bring it up to the cap unit to let them know as well. So I have the form up if you want to see it. Um, when you have a specific situation like what you have described, yeah, I'm having as issues hearing, uh, the light, the light, I can barely hear you. It's super choppy. Oh no. Can y'all turn off y'all cameras? To help yeah, us let's all turn out? off the camera and see if that helps. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Much better. Yes. Okay. So I am looking at the form right now, and it says in parentheses, only one signature is requested. So from our view, we only need one signature of either party, but I can understand if you have dual POAs that both have to sign because of how the POA or the guardianship is written. That, that is sometimes a situation. So do your best to go ahead and have them both sign in that one spot. If that's a condition of the, of the guardianship paperwork or the legal representative paperwork that you're working with. But if you um, 
you can just have only one signature because it says only one signature is requested, okay? All right, I'm just reading the questions here. It says it would be nice to have a space for the support recipient to sign on the UNIO4, even if not required. It allows the person to be involved in self-directing their supports. Good suggestion. Um, uh, let's ahead. just make sure we're clarifying. We're talking about the NFLOC 04. So this mm. is the new, the new NFLOC application. So being specific, both applications can be used right now until the end of August. But then on September 1st, the NFLOC 04 is going to be the primary, oh, it's going to be the only application for NFLOC waivers. Okay. Yeah, we're all getting used to the name, Good don't question. worry. Yep, we're, all, Keeping we're it clear. all getting used to it, yep, exactly. Other thoughts and questions? So I'm seeing a question. Can you clarify why the CIR questions are needed on the NFLOC application? And I, I actually asked that when we prepped this um, for launch a couple of months ago. And it was explained that it's really helpful to be able to have a, um, a an explanation or at least a, a picture of of critical incidents that someone's experienced in the past um, year for the assessor because the assessor takes a look at it if or or you know if a CR wasn't it didn't get filed you know but it's of that same nature that those critical incidents are documented to give a picture for that person's life. Now, if for whatever reason, you know, you didn't file it or you weren't aware of it, um, it's, it's not something that, um, it, it's not a showstopper as far as the application goes. It's really just a tool to help understand the person's past year and what's been going on in their life. Okay. If any major or significant changes that happen to bring them to nursing facility level of care, basically. Mm -hmm. And there are times where it's an initial application. So that person didn't really have, um, they weren't necessarily having the same sort of oversight where critical incidents would be filed. But if they had been in that kind of situation, it would have qualified for it. So when you're talking with a, a prospective um, waiver recipient and they tell you, oh, I went to the ER at this time and I, you know, I had this happen, those would be items you'd mark on there that wouldn't have a CIR because that person maybe wasn't connected within our system yet. So it's used for dual purposes. Yeah, and documenting like police reports and situations like that. Um, some, some questions, well, what about, you know, oh, can't the assessor pull it from the CAR and like pull that information? It's not as 
um, it's not as straightforward as that. Um, it, it really is, and I wish it was, but it, it really doesn't capture the information in that kind of context that makes it really easy for the assessor to grab at the time. But what this is really important for is for folks that, especially on an initial, you wouldn't have that kind of data. You wouldn't have a CIR already in. The question, you know, was a CIR submitted for this event, yes or no? Um, that's something that if there's a very critical situation that happened, maybe an assessor might have to do research for it and look it up in the system. But some for those folks where they haven't had CRRs filed, you know, it's still important to document. So some of you are saying, well, I don't know if um, CIRs, CIRs were filed for some of the situations that I encountered. If you don't know, it's okay to just say, no, you don't know. Um, because you don't know if it was done. You didn't know that happened. It's okay to say no. Um, it's not a showstopper in that sense. That is correct. We have had similar questions over the years about critical incident reporting in general. We're not requiring people to know what they don't know. That's impossible. Yeah. So if you have a no answer to that question, then just put a no. And if you don't know, just put no, because then you're, you're all correct. We do have the records. If we need to put all that record set together, we can do it. You know, but you need to fill out the report from, or I'm sorry, fill out, of course, the CIR, but fill out the form from, from the best of what you know. And here's a good question. Medications in Harmony and Assessors, are there any updates? That's a good one. We have another work meeting on that coming up. We did come up to some conclusions that there's some workflow issues with this particular area. Um, you as a care coordinator should refrain from entering any medications until after an assessment has occurred, especially for initials. Um, we have noted that assessors have a really difficult time pulling the medications lists, and that's why you will see that they entered medications that you already entered or are still active from the previous year, and they just put them in again, and they put them in incompletely. That's what you see. And you're right, that you're, you're not losing your mind. That's what's happening. They're putting in the same thing that was already there, and they're not doing it fully. And it is 100% related to how our mobile CAT assessment tool, the mobile version, operates. It's making it really difficult to get accurate data in that area. All teams are aware of that and are trying our best to figure out how we may be able to adjust this process. So, um, what what do you need to do for now? Continue following your order of operations for the process, going in and putting them in after the fact. Um, we are, we've worked with the review teams and they know that the medications are all over the place and the review teams, when looking at the support plan, will not be as um, focused on that specific area because of this data control, this data management issue. So that's the updates we have for you on medications right now. It is still ongoing though. We're continuing to have to work on work on this because it's um, for as it is causing you a lot of time uh, to clean it up. It is also causing a lot of time internally on doing entries. And so we are looking for efficiencies because there's a lot of lost time happening on this topic. So we're working on figuring it out, but it's requiring a lot of logistics. Delight and team, I just went and red flagged one and I wasn't sure of the answer. 
I saw an, I just saw another okay. one. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm seeing that they're denying applications without making meds match in harmony. That is very interesting because I just had a question about that. And um, essentially we, because they're not supposed to do that. And so what did we do to fix that? We actually took away the methods for looking at medications from internal staff at that point. So they shouldn't be able to look at that anymore. Um, it was a miscommunication internally. So you should not be having issues with your applications, medications, and your Harmony consumer record it should not be something that you should be encountering. Is it okay to just skip filling the meds on Harmony until it's all worked out? Um, it's your call. So part of the discussions that we've had and where there's some concern is that the support plan is one of the resources for uh, the person, their natural supports, their DSPs, to be able to have an at-a-glance resource for medications. Um, so one side of it is yes, medications are important, but the other side of it is, you know, how much do we need to go into each one of these records and adjust them? So I would encourage you to make sure that the most, like I would encourage you to ensure that the medications are present on there, but to not agonize over duplicates in there um, and to not spend a lot of time cross-referencing duplicates at this time. You can if you're a type A personality, but I really think your time may be better spent on finding other solutions for your client. So ensure that the medications are listed. Um, I would wait until after the assessment to look to see if all the medications have been listed, right? But you don't need to go through them and um, and uh, and discontinue and keep current and adjust all the boxes um, so that they meet the parameters. We've worked with the review teams. So they know that they don't need to be as diligent about checking all those different prescribers and the reasons and of all of those components. So try to leverage that time for better purposes at this time. Thanks, Delight. Okay, so we're just coming up on the top of the hour here. Uh, it's about one minute till. And I just wanted to take a second to thank you for coming to our session today. Um, we'll be sending out an email with your verification of your CEH. And we'll also offer a recording on our YouTube channel of this session and other resources that we put together for you from this discussion. Uh, thank you team for uh, participating in all your great answers. Delight, Cassandra and Kat, and there are care coordination support hours. There, was, uh, there is a care coordination support hour today from four to five, and we're onto the new schedule of care coordination support. Uh, we'll put that in our um, follow up email as well, rather than uh, rather than training office hours, as we had been doing. Okay, thanks again, everybody, and uh, make sure to come to our next session. And we'll we have Director Lee and Deputy Director Newman, and hopefully Commissioner Crum, and we'll put together a list of your uh, hot topics from this session for for them to to know about ahead. All right, so. Take care, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon. And thanks again. Goodbye for now.